All right. So I'm going to start recording um, to our second Creative Spark webinar um, hosted by Newcastle University. Um, before we get started with Lizzie's presentation, I just want to do a quick housekeeping um, announcement and then we can go right into the presentation. Um, okay, so just a quick introduction for those that might be new to it. Um, Creative Spark is the higher education enterprise program running by the British Council. It runs with over 50 partners and we are partnering with the Center for Analysis of Economic Reforms and Communication in Baku. Um, so for the last that's our third year for the last two years. Um, we've been coming to Azerbaijan, delivering training on entrepreneurship education. We're hosting creatons together uh, with different universities, and we hope that continues for a couple more years. Um, because of COVID this year, we couldn't come, so we're hosting these webinar series. In total, we have eight webinars. This is our second. And uh, we also record all the webinars, so if you want to share, if you found it useful and you want to share with your colleagues, feel free to share the recording afterwards. Um, so we do record the session, um, we put it on a public website, so if you feel uncomfortable having your video shared, please feel free to, you know, um, and stop your video, um, please mute also your microphones, but when we come to the Q&A, it would be great if you could uh, play your video so we can see why you ask questions. Um, if your bandwidth is not good enough, feel free to post any questions at any time in the chat and I will ask them later on to Lucy. Um, and lastly, after the chat, um, after the presentation, we will have a quick survey and I would really appreciate if you can give us some feedback on the webinar. So without further ado, um, today's webinar is about spinning out best practices from the university. So Newcastle University um, has spun out over 20 companies in the last um, five years now. And even during the COVID crisis, they have been very successful attracting funding, recruiting staff members and supporting spin outs. Uh, so Lizzie has been managing the program for the last couple of years. She also lectures on entrepreneurship at the Business School and the Faculty of Science, Agriculture, Engineering. And if anyone knows about um, commercialization and spinning out ventures from academics and postgraduate students, it's Lizzie. So without further ado, Lizzie will present her uh, insights, her information, and then afterwards we go into Q&A. So feel free to ask any questions afterwards. Lizzie, you're welcome. Hello, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just, well, before I start my presentation, let me just introduce myself and thank you. Um, Andrea for the um, lovely introduction. So a bit about me and my background. So, um, oh, and also let me introduce my cat who seems to have uh, parked himself here. And if I try and move him, he'll just sing. So we, it's best that just to leave him here. Um, but if he gets too annoying, I'll budge him off. Anyway, so a um, uh, plotted history of how um, I got to be here and spinning out being company creation manager and responsible for moving um, research out of labs and off benches and into successful businesses is my background is running companies. So um, I have been involved um, in three as a founder, director and shareholder. Um, the businesses that I've been, uh, I was involved with um, all technology based firms. Um, my background isn't actually uh, as a developer, um, I just sort of, as most people with sort of an entrepreneurial spirit, stumbled into that world. And um, I've been involved, the first company I was involved with was a software as a service business based in the education and corporate education sector, a company called The Test Factory, which we grew in the northeast of England to uh, 40 people. And um, we eventually sold it successfully in 2014. Um, and my responsibility was looking after all of the corporate customers. And so I spent my days waking up with HSBC in Hong Kong and going to sleep with Microsoft in Seattle. So I had the full um, startup to scale up journey that's now studied. But the time we were doing it, back to 2008, 2009, don't even think Lean Startup was published until 2009, 2010. But my esteemed colleagues will keep me right here. So. Um, uh, I'm more of a sort of 
a lecturer of practice now um, and my experiences have then been um, transferred into um, once the test factory successfully sold I've been involved in a um, number of other technology companies including starting up a consultancy. Um, the reason why I love what I do is the privilege of seeing high tech research realizing its potential and its potential is often through forming a new entity and that's what I'm going to talk about today about how we recognize those opportunities and particularly focus on a program that we have called execs into business and the sort of sweet spot we found of what happens when um, fantastic research gets coupled with management experience and funding and how that can really accelerate a startup into a high growth company. So let me start sharing my screen. Um, let's go back to the very beginning. Right. So, um, as Andrea um, Andrea commented before, we've had quite a successful COVID period, which uh, not everybody can say, but we kind of expected when March uh, 2020 happened, myself and my colleague David Huntley, who's head of company creation, we thought, well, we'll probably have a busy couple of weeks whilst we tie up a, a few loose things and then things will start to tail off and quite the opposite happened. Um, we've um, continued at some accelerated pace of spinning out companies. And during the COVID period, as it says there, we span out um, eight companies, but also from our portfolio of the 22 businesses that we currently have shortly to become 25. Um, they also raised a lot of capital um, for Series A and C capital um, during the lockdown period as well. Um, and also continue to thrive and employ people um, during this time. And as I sort of go through our portfolio and catch up with people now, um, most of our businesses are actually quite buoyant. And there's a reason for that, I think. And the trend seems to be that um, most of our companies, as I'll just go through in a second, are um, based on years of research and therefore demand hasn't sort of wavered for what they do because of the COVID um, um, crisis. And as we move out of that period and as we go into a post-Brexit era, there's a real surge in terms of where the importance of acknowledging where's innovation going to come from in the UK and government, I think, are going to look more and more to our universities and our institutions um, that, to actually um, ask whether these are far better places to sort of make sure that we continue with that great homegrown uh, reputation that Britain has for innovating and being the um, and having thought leadership on particularly um, the two fields that Newcastle in particular excels at in terms of research which is um, science, agriculture, agriculture and engineering and within the faculty of medical sciences and um, medical technology. So something happened, uh, this hasn't all just sort of emerged from a willingness, well, there certainly needed to be a willingness to do good stuff. But if we go wind back five, 10 years ago, we were lucky if we were spinning out one company a year. Newcastle, as I can talk for more so than some of the other institutions in the uh, northeast of the UK, um, was um, very similar to a, the journey that a lot of uh, higher education institutions have been on. They were very much focused on teaching and research, and then the outputs of those research is the research tended to be uh, working with commercial companies to license and uh, or you know producing paper as research income, and the focus on actually or could what is the best place if it is the best place for some of this research to be actually in a, a new commercial entity if that was considered the right route the university didn't make it particularly easy for uh, academics to realize that and so that's changed um five years ago when um we started to really focus on what needs to be in place in order for a company 
to spin out. And through two uh, programs were funded through that. The first one, Executives into Business, which I will talk through. And the second one um, is the more broader Northern Accelerator program. So Northern Accelerator program, as it highlights here, combines the five regional uh, institutions, Newcastle, Northumbria, Sunderland, Teesside, and Durham. Um, under a banner of how can we support um, academics in moving research into companies and what does the infrastructure need to have within it in order to realise um, an ambition to make this happen more. And this is where the different elements have come in. So if you think of it in sort of like a funnel, the Northern Accelerator Programme houses everything from, as you see with the Ideas Impact Hub, from a, um, a training and support in how to help and support academics start to think more commercially to try and consider the impact of what their research could be over and above either supporting a professor or you know doing the day-to-day -day job of um, or even pushing out papers to really thinking about well, what's the bigger um, economic um, or world benefit of what you're doing and once you start thinking about impact then we need to start to think about well how does that need how can that go out in the world and start to get some more commercial and innovative um, knowledge base to make sure that they are um, understand and are able to have conversations that um, will lead to opportunities that are unfolding. And those don't have to necessarily be business. It's not all about, you know, how can we make more money on the bottom line? This is as much about um, making um, ambition happen and supporting that. So we have a training program for both for um, early career researchers to help them get excited about the ideas and concepts around um, commercialization, entrepreneurship and impact. And then we have another training program called Future Founders, which is more so for our um, academic founders um, to make sure that they've got that business readiness so that they're going to be um, responsible and con contributing directors, founders, shareholders. We have funding um, available. So we have um, invested 1.6 million in grants to proof of concept funding to um, help them go from um, a prototype to something that is ready for market. Um, we have the Execs into Business program, which I'll talk about, which is about bringing management in. Um, we also have a seed incorporation fund. So this is actual, um, we have 1.6 million pounds given to us from Research England, which we have then invested into um, our spin out companies. Um, and we brought in a venture capital firm to manage that for us. And from there, we then have got the wider ambition of actually raising a venture fund, which um, the five universities are actually looking to invest in themselves. And then we're going to go out to market and um, look to hopefully raise between 50 and 70 million um, in uh, venture capital funding to then really ensure the sustainability of once we have created these startup companies, that there is um, money to support them scale and grow, and to then also make sure that they're then rooted in the region so that there is the economic benefit of companies being founded here and growing and high tech skilled jobs being created. So that's the Northern Accelerator program. Um, we've just been extended for another two years. Um, and um, it's been hugely impactful and a great um, beacon, really, for how institutions can actually collaborate and work together and not work against each other, um, and particularly within the, within the region. And this is just an example of then how we've been able to grow and thrive. And actually, this um, sort of graph now needs to be expended into 21, 22. Um, I currently have three businesses that I'm currently in legal stages of um, founding, so it continues to thrive. The challenge as we move forward is, you know, there is a sort of slight fear that we've taken a lot of the low, low hanging fruit, as it were, in terms of uh, commercial readiness. But there's been a real culture shift, particularly in Newcastle, in the um, 
once you see someone else do something, it becomes real in the world and it could be possible for you. And so there has been that sort of ambition that people are starting to sort of realise that not just for professors who will not, you know, not, they're not going to leave their jobs, you know, they, they might consult into a business at, um, a few days a week, but for um, researchers to actually think, oh, you know, maybe there's a job where I can still realise my research um, ambitions, but it might be better to be applied into a company. Um, and that's really becoming more and more um, interest to um, as a career path as it is to continue down the classic academic route. But this is a list of our companies. Um, I can share a link at the end to our company creation page, but uh, this is, um, I've got two lists here. This is our, in the Faculty of Medical Sciences um, list of companies. Um, so if you just, I won't go into all of them in detail, happy to answer any questions about any of them. But just to give you an idea of the sort of things that we're working on here, um, and to see for you to start to spot some of the trends in where we really specialize as an institution. Um, as you can see, there's lots of cell based research, diagnostics, um, and one of um, um, organ transplantation. So that's a new way of moving organs um, to be able to preserve them for longer. So currently, an organ can last in an icebox. Um, tops eight hours. This um, device believes that it, well, it can keep an organ alive definitely for 24 hours, but maybe even 72 hours. So absolute game-changing technologies. Glycoscore, um, a diagnostic for prostate cancer, removes, removes the need from the very uh, invasive um, diagnostic that's currently done that has a lot of consequences, that moves towards the blood and the urine sample to be able to measure the PSA levels. Um, Cellular Revolution just raised a million pounds um, in Series A funding. Um, continuous cell development for the development of clean meat. Um, uh, New Cells Biotech just raised 6.7 million, I think it was, um, removing the need for um, animal, um, uh, animal testing in drug development because, they're able, because of what they're able to do with stem cells. XR Therapeutics has raised uh, half a million in seed capital to um, deliver um, autism therapy for the treatment of autism phobias. So um, young people are put in sort of an immersive environment and through years of um, research, they're able to actually, um, for want of a better word, cure autism phobias where young people after a few sessions are able to, where they're not able to even leave the house, they're able to go to a busy supermarket or shopping mall. Um, so, yeah, as you can hear, I'm very proud of what we do because it's very exciting. You know, this is game changing stuff, doing good things in the world. What we don't fund and don't support tends to be, you know, we're not going to support the next napalm. We're not going to go and support anything that tears up mermaids houses. Um, if you just look at this with our science, agriculture and engineering spin out. Uh, advanced electric machines at the top, the Guardian, both the Guardian and Telegraph both recently wrote an article that this could be um, one of the next British unicorns. A unicorn is a business that's valued over a million dollars. Um, it's a way of um, electric motors that don't need the, that remove the need for rare earth magnets. Um, so remove the need for the Chinese market who hold the majority of rare earth magnets. Um, Amartus Oceanic, uh, Alan Jameson, uh, sort of the Brian Cox, if you're aware of him. So the, uh, he's an expert of, the, of mapping the deep sea, has recently gone further, um, deeper than anybody has ever been able to photograph before. And was very famous because he found plastic down there, found plastic at 8,000 meters below the sea level. Um, and then, so this is, some of our businesses that we that uh, we work with that are all um, startup but now really scaling up, and that's the um, important important thing here that we are nurturing um, companies who are going to be scaling up. And they're all employing people, and that they're well funded, and that's the important thing. And that's what I know I've done my job right in terms of identifying the research that's going to happen. 
So I thought that I would talk to you this morning about the Execs into Business program because that is really core to the Northern Accelerator and what we do. The Execs into Business program really came about because um, if I talk frankly, you know, most of the time an academic running the business is not the best thing for the academic, the business or the opportunity. And there's a few reasons why that is. Firstly, it's oftentimes it's not what they want to do. They've got a great idea, but they're not necessarily got the inclination or the excitement to go and leave their job and go and uh, invest their time in becoming a chief exec of a company. Um, but also being a chief exec of a company is a, is a valued, important skill that somebody has honed for as long as somebody that should be as valued as much as the person who has been researching something for 25 years, somebody that's been running businesses and has experience of running companies. That those two sets of experiences are the, of the same value um, and they should be respected in the same way. So um, it's important that we needed to acknowledge that to either expect an academic to leave their career or to expect them to run a company as just a hobbyist, it just was never going to realise the potential of some of this research. And so we started to bring in um, management um, to work alongside academics and management being experience, chief execs, chairmen, managing directors. But unfortunately, all we had to offer at the beginning was equity, was so some shares in the company. And the profile of somebody that's able to do that is quite small. There's only really sort of a, it's not as usual as somebody that doesn't need any sort of remuneration in order to be able to take on that kind of role. So we developed the Execs into Business program, which combines the remuneration, so giving them some uh, an executive and experienced CEO some money, and um, also you know, giving them some equity to move the, the, move the research out to university and into um, a new company. And the important thing is that Newcastle University has a very structured approach and very willing approach to making this happen. And that's absolutely fundamental in this success. And this has been really successful to date. We've um, recruited 28 experienced executives to work alongside our company. Um, but it's only been possible because there's been a willingness and a process in place. And if you guys are interested, we have a very formalised IP policy and if you've got nothing better to do, but it is worth going and having a look because it's on the website, it's absolutely available. And so if your institution's a bit further back in the world in terms of, um, and some of these some of these other universities that we work with are very still very much still you know starting in their infancy of spinning out companies it's worthwhile going and looking at the flow diagram that we have in there that shows how we um, spin businesses out but hopefully this should cover most of what we do so it's exit into business program um, basically allows a process for um, executives to come and bid for the opportunity to work with um, our academics so first of all, we need to make sure we identify what it is, what um, as our tech transfer officers and myself working out the, um, the point that some research is ready to spin out. And that tends to happen when there's been some generation of some IP, so some intellectual property, which has then become tangible and the point of needs to go out in the world. It's gonna go out in the world in order to reach its potential. So either there's a patent, or there's sort of a creation of a widget or some technology. There's a moment in time where the research can't go any further. Now it needs to go and prove and do what it says it's going to do. Um, and that decision comes down to me and my team. Um, and at that point, we then want to decide, well, do we want to, uh, is this appropriate for bringing an exec in to run it? Most of the time, I can only think of two instances where we have um, academics who have left their university roles to run companies. So that shows you how rare, and you know, that's out of 28. So it shows you how rare it is that academics do, but it is absolutely possible and we can make that happen. But most of the time we're, we need to bring in management. 
Um, and the reason we need to bring in management is because we need to bring in that experience to make sure that there's someone, everybody's in the right place for doing the best they possibly can. You get the scientists doing their best, they're doing their, you know, creating the roadmap for, for, their, um, for their technology. And the management is there to create the roadmap for the overall business and the potential. And also oftentimes to realise the potential that, the academic might not have seen you know if you've been in your world of research for a long time and you might be the thought leader in a particular field but you might not have thought about the diversity of the application of what you've created and sometimes it needs somebody else to come along with a fresh pair of eyes and the ambition and the experience to actually say well you know what I think we've got some more things we can do here so once we've realised that we're going to do that, we then need to, um, that we're going to go through execs into business funding, we then write a tender um, and have some KPIs of what we need this management um, solution, you know, usually a chief exec, to do. And then once they have done that, um, because it's public money, they have to bid for the work. And then um, most of the time it's around, they get paid around £30,000 to deliver those milestones that have been um, decided. So I've just talked about the week, this process. So we have our universities um, decide that we're going to spin something out. We write an application to bid for the funding. Um, I'm going to have a funding term down. So maybe that's uh, an ind indication of how uh, uh, how much willingness we have to also spend this money too um, and also you know we're well experienced now in in doing this um, and then we identify the uh, milestones we need the tent the um, executive to do in order to make sure that the universe that the um, research gets spun out and then and we have so this is just a point I hadn't mentioned before we have a pool of um, people of executives who are within what we call the talent pool so whenever we send these tenders out which is tends to be about five or six a year they go out to this pool of people who have applied to be on our executive to business talent pool most of the time we know who we want to do this because most of the time we need someone, we need to go and source someone that's got experience in the field. If you're thinking that, you know, if the start startup um, capital that's required tends to be between 150 to half a million pounds, we need someone that's going to be able to go out and talk eloquently, not in necessarily in detail about the technology, but certainly eloquently about the technology and so show an understanding of the market and hopefully bring a network with them as well that the um, startup can tap into in order to make sure that they get not only funding but also customers too. So most of the time we know who this person's going to be or, or know, have a few people in mind. But sometimes we don't. And we have Cellular Revolution that I mentioned before. Um, they, their like, chief executive, still their chief exec after three years, he actually um, came from um, the university in Holland. Not a university, sorry. He came from Holland. That's where he was, um, he's based. Um, and he had heard about this program. He had signed up and applied and won the contract is now still the CEO and has just um, been successfully raised a million pounds for the company. So um, it does also work both within our talent pool and knowing people as well. So I thought I'd just come up with an example company. So to sort of bring this to life, to see how this works um, and to sort of highlight the key areas and key milestones and structure that we have in place. Um, that um, really makes this program successful and without the structure how you can see how quickly this would all fall over so my company is called Purple Quantum um, and I've just written a scenario which is very typical an exciting opportunity of academic research uh, academics founders don't have commercial expertise um, and so they need a, a full-time CEO and that's very very much atypical that you know somebody is because we've got this precedence as well of where we've had so many companies now spin out 
the academics are much more comfortable now being coming and asking for help and support and also being not the smartest person in the room when it comes to business because there's been a um there's an alumni now of academics who have gone through have gone through this and so there's confidence in the process as well so first stage is that, that we decide the profile of who we need so what sort of skills are required and this tends to change based on the experience that's already around the table in terms of the academic founders um, sometimes we have academic founders particularly if you've been an early career researcher who's looking to move and work in the company um, who is very keen to take a very active role within the business and so we're looking for more of a chairman sort of person to, a mentor um, because under some supervision maybe the researcher will be able to step up and actually become a sort of a, a key member of the the management team um, and then sometimes the academic founders just want to continue with their research, continue with their lab based work. And so we're really looking for somebody to take ownership of this and really create a vision for what they believe this research can once in the business can um, can achieve. So those tend to be the different sort of scale of profiles when we're looking at experience. And of course, we need experience in the field. And we need experience of starting up companies, but also scaling up companies and raising um, money. So we ask our executives, we tend to ask them to do four phases. So the first thing we ask them to do is to write a business plan. So business plan needs to be ambitious, but realistic. It needs to have um, a clear financial plan and needs to have a clear plan of how much money this is going to need in order to realize its potential. Oh, sorry, I've got my cat here. Um, once we're happy, so we're happy is me happy with the business plan, um, that then goes to our IP spin out committee. So at Newcastle University, we have an IP spin out committee that meets quarterly, which reviews um, spin outs and decides whether this is the best place for this research to go. And what happens is the business plan and the management team present at this um, meeting. It's a bit like my homework's getting judged as well. And I sort of put forward these uh, spin outs and we ask, well, there are a few externals, but it tends to be, it's chaired by Mike Capaldi, who is the uh, Dean of um, Enterprise and then uh, Brian Walker's um, who is the PVC for research at Newcastle University. So it's got um, Richard Dale, who is the finance director. So it's got a high profile of uh, the executive board, which is important because I know that if I was listening to me, I'd be like, oh God, you can just imagine them creating problems. But we've created a culture that is about saying yes, unless there's a very valid reason why this shouldn't go ahead so we asked them to look at a few things firstly we asked the board to look at the business plan we asked them to uh, review whether the um requirements for funding are realistic but oftentimes you know the questions are is that enough money rather than if it's too little and we asked them to look at the management team and really get a sense for, and this is the fun bit that I like because it's not the logical stuff, you get a sense for, does this seem like a cohesive team? Does this look like you took out anyone, if you took out any of the academic founders or the, the CEO and went and sat them in the room, would they have a similar answer if you asked them about what the hopes were for the, for the company? So we try not to make it too much like a Dragon's Den pitch, but it's, um, it's a high pressure uh, for the academics and for the CEO and not most get signed off not, and some get signed off with some provisos sometimes we'll say yes this will go ahead but we would like to take a seat on the board or we would like you to go away and look at these financials a bit more but most of the time that they, they get approved straight away and straight away means literally the same day i will tell them whether they've been successful or not and this is really then showing the energy that's needed from the institution to keep pushing these along. We don't ever want to be the reason why a company isn't spinning out, isn't getting out there in the world. So phase three is when we sort of split off 
the university has its own legal representation, the company then forms and has its own legal representation. And we agree the um, legal formalities um, for setting up a company. So there's the articles of association, there's all of the agreements, if they need access to um, facilities or if there's any consultancy agreements, um, in, in terms of how much time the academics will be working in the company. And we also agree when um, the IP that we are assigning, we're agreeing when it will be licensed. So a spin out basically is the uh, university um, licensing the IP, whether that's a patent or know-how, into a company in exchange for shares. So in our, for our um, university, which is, again, this is all public knowledge, it's on the IP policy, Newcastle University retains 40% and the academics get a 60% share. That doesn't get negotiated. The only time that changes is if there's another institution involved. So if there's a um, hospital trust, if there is another university, then the university will then dilute. Um, but the academics and the CEO will be, their shares will be allocated from the 60%. But the licensing, of, we initially license the IP to the company. We assign it once they've reached a particular trigger point. And this is to um, protect the academics as much as it is to protect the university. If the company went pop, if they had to liquidate, if the IP was assigned, that would be an intangible asset that could be acquired by somebody else. So if it's just licensed and for whatever reason it fails early on, we can then call back the IP to the university and then, the, the, and then that IP and the academics are protected. And then finally, there are four, four phases to raise the seed funding. So raising the seed funding or grant capital, whatever that is, in order that's been described in the business plan in order to start the business. Um, and that just describes what we've been talking about with the 30,000. So this tends to be the time frame for how quickly we try and move through this. Um, so the first phase in terms of getting the tender out there and advertising um, for the opportunity, that tends to take between six to eight weeks. And then once you get to this stage, it's much more formal. So we then have two months to write a business plan, um, um, months to sort of get through the university processes, three months to get legals, and then around about three months for the seed capital to um, be realised. But it tends to all, the phase three and four tend to work in the um, same um, like in a conjunct manner um, and then this tends to be how the milestones are paid to the executive so you can see the weighting based on where we really feel that things are super important so the business plan um, is a big one and obviously we're not going to pay somebody until they um, raise the C capital and then there tends to be between 10 and 20 percent equity awarded to the chief exec well, not really awarded, given to the chief exec at phase three when the company is formed. But there's also a get out clause at this point as well. So if things aren't really working out, this is the opportunity for the executive to step um, to step away. Um, but also it's the time for the uh, academic team to just really make sure that this is the right person. I always say that executives into business is a uh, is definitely uh, we offer a dating service rather than a marriage bureau. It's not my accountability to make sure that they get on and are able to find a way of working together. But I promise you that nothing, it's never ever the technology that's the issue. If there's going to be an issue along the way, it's going to be people butting heads and trying to work through issues. And that's part of the startup company. And if we were talking to an accelerator program, you know, they'd say the same thing. It's the part and parcel of trying to work out, you know, who is the best people to come in to really make that dynamic magic happen. And you know, for me, I find it absolutely fascinating of the sort of 
there's no perfect sort of personality types of, you know, you can get a really gregarious CEO and a really quiet academic or a super loud academic and more of a sort of laid back or quiet CEO. And they all sort of tend to work in well in different ways. It just depends on whether you can find that real sweet spot of respect of that everybody has for each other's knowledge and then the leadership coming from the CEO to really then make that drive and to make all of this happen because you know this is all of this is just a process to start in a company as soon as the company started they're on their own you know it's not for us to interfere with um you know we'll there be there to support but it's not our responsibility to then continue to sort of nurture that company and all that they want they don't want the university come and knock on the door every five minutes saying we've got any sales yet so um yeah we do tend to be pulled back in if things tend to go a little bit awry but they tend to just go awry in a ways that all startup companies go sometimes wobble not getting things out there quick enough and uh over promising under delivering and relationship management it's my experience so, and I've got 15 minutes left. I've written a few questions here that I thought might be of interest. I'm happy to work through some of these and you guys can just listen. Or I'm very happy for you to ask any questions at all. I appreciate I've sort of done a big brain dump of something that's quite a big concept. So I'd just love to know what's landed for you, what questions you've got, where this feels like it, you know, you've got similarities or um, how this might apply to different types of companies because we haven't even talked about social enterprise, which is obviously a very viable part of what I do as well. So yeah, absolutely happy for you. If anybody's got any questions, if not, I'll just work through these. Um, so let's open up the floor for questions, Lizzie. Um, Judah had one, um, and I think... Uh, actually two questions the first one was how do you find the academics to actually spin out a business and the second one how do you find the people for the talent pool you addressed that quite a bit but maybe how do you find the academics um well i suppose um that's what's happened through a culture shift in newcastle so we have Newcastle University has tech transfer officers or we call them business development managers who are responsible within each school for managing the, um, their portfolio of research. And so their responsibility is checking in and managing what the academics are up to and what they're, what, you know, what they're researching at that moment in time who are they working with? So I've got a really close relationship with all of the business development managers at Newcastle University who then feed through to me. The other place they come out from tends to be if we sort of start running a training programme or if we have funding opportunities, then sometimes people just come out of the woodwork that none of us really knew about who have been steadily working on um, a project for a period of time that they just hadn't had the opportunity to really chat to anybody about or hadn't necessarily thought until they thought, oh, I'll just go along to this training program um, and I'll have a, a, a chat about what it is that I'm doing and then suddenly get the uh, invitation to, oh, this is something I could really do. I, I, could, I could have a go at doing this or I can at least have my technology appraised of whether it's spin out ready. Um, so we just open up the floors and um, you can unmute yourself. Um, so Nazreen first, then Chris. Okay. Nazreen, do you want to ask your question in person? Or? Yeah, of course. Uh, hello to all. And uh, thank you, Lisa. It was a great session. I would like to ask that the, are you, are your platform open to new partnerships? Generally, uh, like uh, with the life science startups, or um, what's the general negotiations with the other companies? With other companies, um, yeah. so so oftentimes research is um, if somebody's come up with a new way of getting toothpaste to stick to a toothbrush, the best way for that to 
place for that to be isn't probably in a company that would be with a partnership within with another um probably pharmaceutical company so you know johnson and johnson or um, procter and gamble so that's where the partnership um tend to be more prolific within universities in terms of our companies partnering with somebody else to do a new venture um that can be quite complex in terms of the IP ownership, like so who owns what. Um, so I can't think of an example where we've had, most of the time we would ask the company to lead on it and then, then we would assign our IP for a, and then we would then draw back revenue, uh, have a shared revenue agreement on, um, especially if they were a more established company. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean that, uh, uh, like, it can be companies who, who are uh, whose work also like working with life science startups, and maybe like partnership, uh, like um, the researcher uh, exchange or something like expert exchange, something like uh, partnerships. I mean. Um. So you do. What, um, what, I don't quite, okay, have you got an example of something that you've? Uh, let's take the, there's some company in Germany and uh, they also working with the life science startups and uh, would like open, are, are your platform open to like research exchange, research exchange, uh, mentor expert exchange with that companies? Yeah, so we have, uh, so there's a lot of knowledge exchange that happens within the mm -hmm. university. Um, and we have sort of like knowledge exchange partnerships that happen too. Um, it tends and tend to be around sort of spin out with spin out companies, um, but it certainly helps academics get more exposure to different ways of commercialization and more exposure to companies, so that they start to then get an understanding of how you know, companies work. Um, but yeah, I can't think of where that's necessarily applied to a spin out. It tends to be, why does it, it tends to be a different office, right? Or like the knowledge exchange rather than with, situated with you. Yes, yeah. So we have um, a guy called Carl Wall manages our knowledge transfer partnerships, but those are specifically a academic working within a large company with the agreement that they will, the outputs will be for the benefit of the company not for the benefit of the university. Um, and the same applies to licenses, right? So if someone wants to license to Johnson Johnson, that's not your job. That's again, the knowledge transfer or- Yeah, whatever. yeah. So that's the business development managers. They do that. I specifically work on just new ventures being formed. All right, great. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks very much, Lizzie. That was very interesting. Really enjoyed it. So um, yeah, I kind of have three questions which um, I'd like to ask. So I think I, I think I mentioned, you know, I, I've been researching crowdfunding, and actually I've been researching really uh, more type retail type business crowdfunding with uh, you're probably aware of like Crowd Cube and Cedars. So um, I can see why the businesses you know you're working with don't actually appear on Crowd Cube and Cedars because they're specialist businesses. Um, but I was just wondering, is, does crowd come, uh, funding has it or could it come into what you're doing at all? It's funny you mentioned that because we were actually having this conversation yesterday um, about crowdfunding. I think it's unregulated nature, and you might be able to tell me otherwise, would certainly make the university very nervous. Although I do know that some of the student enterprises have done very well from crowdfunding. Usually there is a bench capital um, element that, that de-risks the need for potentially not making uh, um, the level of crowdfunding that might be Required. So, you know, if we're asking for, and the, if there's a need for 150 to half a million in C capital, 
to put it out there and that not then be happening. Whereas if you're also looking for a, if a venture capitalist can bring expertise, can bring networks. Um, and also the other thing is crowdfunding, there tends to be an exchange for something. And therefore there isn't usually something, you know, if this is a, a, a new diagnostic, other than it being a good thing in the world, you can really then say, or you could, in five years time, you could be the first beneficiary of this. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can see it's a different area. I mean, you know, it would um, perhaps need some specialist people. But the, in my experience, there is quite a lot of venture capital funding and crowdfunding in that any campaign actually raises quite a bit of funding before it ever gets on the crowdfunding site. Um, yeah, you have to sort of have, you have to already have quite, like sometimes they, they, they have a bar, don't they, of how much you've got to raise. Yeah, it's interesting. I'd like to know, learn more about it, really. Yeah, basically what I've found is really a campaign will stand a much greater chance of success if you already have about 70 to 80% of the funding already raised. And then the excess is the platform users come along and then they invest, you know, the people who perhaps are outside your network mm -hmm. on, the, on the platform, you can attract those people through crowdfunding. But um, yeah, it just relates to um, kind of a second question. Because in, in what I'm studying, I found that the two schemes from the government, the SEIS and the mm -hmm. EIS schemes, which for everybody else are, are, are venture capital funding schemes for the government. The first one's the seed enterprise investment scheme and the second one's just the enterprise investment scheme. Do they come into what you're doing? Yes. So particularly if we've got any angel capital, any angel investors, very much so. Um, usually angel investors will come in, will be involved if there is, if there tends to be sort of something that pulls on the heartstrings a little bit. Right. Um, and uh, so some, sometimes from like family houses or if there is, um, yeah, so angel investors who are, are more of a portfolio. So we don't tend to deal with that many individuals because usually they're being brought in as part of a, um, as part of a group of people who are going to make up the investment that happens. But that scheme, you know, for the for the wealthier who are looking to have a flutter, is uh, you know the tax benefits from that are um, have certainly helped. Um, open up uh, investing for people who perhaps wouldn't have thought of doing it otherwise. Right, right. Okay, interesting. Um, and the third thing was, do you also provide some kind of space for these businesses to operate in? Yeah, so there tends to be a facilities access agreement. So usually most of our spin outs, as you see from the original list, was there is um, a need for um, equipment and they were usually working within the space. So the university will give, usually give a, um, a space for a year free of charge. Um, I mean, if you're looking to be in a dynamic startup space, it's probably not going to be the most exciting like area but if you need a load of lab equipment around you and access to that then um, we uh, give them a year's access free of charge um, but oftentimes mo majority of our businesses that are on my faculty of medical, medical sciences the majority of them are based at the core so um, there is a next to the business school in Newcastle, there's a big area with a number of, there's a catalyst, we're building called the catalyst, the core, and then the biosphere, and the majority of our businesses in that space. There's a really good cluster down there now of companies. All right, right, interesting. Um, so we have a last question from Jonathan. Yeah, hi Lizzie, that's a really interesting presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, um, because the examples that you gave in terms of the spin outs from the university came mainly from the medical school and from SAGE. Mm -hmm. But also, do you have examples that are from HASS, from social sciences, arts, humanities, ideas? 
just a bit Let of background. So I'm the, the PI of Creative Fuse Northeast. We've just done some, uh, some research on access to finance for creative businesses and found that they, they tend to have uh, certain barriers in terms of the investment community and perhaps not, not best understanding what proposition they're bringing forward. And so even having innovated in the past, we find that they're, if anything, that could actually be a bias in terms of financiers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can well imagine that. Yeah. I mean, is that, I mean, is we, that your experience? And do you have has, has spin outs that are in the pipeline? We have two. So, actually, one of our best success stories is a company called VO, which is um, came out of humanities, um, mm. arts, and social sciences, which sold, the university sold their shares, I think, and about 20 million off the back of it. Um, so, okay. yeah, startup still going. Got um, got acquired um it's a um in t it's, it's come out of the education it's a teaching um oh uh, yeah um tool there's also future homes which is from um professor rose gilroy um okay so the challenge that we have is not definitely not a willingness not I don't think there's a much of an engagement with us, but the chat, but also we have to work on things that have scale. It's and scale doesn't mean necessarily money, but scale means that it can be ecologically viable, ec economically viable. Um, mm. And that then therefore tends to we end up having quite a lot of conversations that don't come and come to much fruition because people just seem to back away super quickly because their accountability comes super fast. If you want to make this happen, yeah, yeah. then you're going to have to, you know, step forward and think of particularly, it seems to fall down on understanding what would be the right model for whatever that enterprise, whether it's a social enterprise, if it's a community interest company, if it's a charity, and I think there needs to be a lot more education around that in across the sort of humanities, arts and social sciences, so that to help mm -hmm. realise more potential, because that seems to where things fall down instantly. Is that, is that to do with the business model? Yeah, so if, you, the, if you've got a great idea... That's, the legal status? Exactly. All of those things, that's the first question. And... The, it's not up to university to, to decide that. It needs to be the decision of the academics. But and you know we could bring in management. It's it, you know it needs to be a collective decision. But there needs to be education mm. around what the consequences are of mm. what the best way of setting something up in order for it to access funding ultimately. Because if you're a charity that'll open up some funding, but if you're a social enterprise, that would open up others. And so you, you can't, there has to be a business mindset. And that seems to be where mm -hmm. people tend to get a little bit scared. But I'd love to chat sure, to you some yeah. more because I've got some good examples of some opportunities that have come along. Yeah. And then as soon as you sort of start to pod and push them a little bit, they sort of crumble. Okay, that would be great, yeah. Let's, uh, let's meet. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm aware of time. So if you have any further questions or if you would like to connect with Lizzie, I'm sure you can just email me back. Um, and then I'll I just put my email in the chat. Or even back up, Lizzie. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, before we head out, just quickly, um, uh, our next webinar is next week, Tuesday. Um, it will be about how colleagues from the business school are using Stanford University's D-School design thinking model, and especially how they brought it online. Um, so it's quite commonly used in the classroom, but um, Fiona and her team have used it um, online on Zoom, um, and she will share a little bit about how that worked and some pitfalls and some things to think about. So it will be next week, Tuesday. Um, you can sign up again, and then I can send you the link. Um, otherwise, um, I will send you the link afterwards um, for feedback, so please do give us some feedback. Um, if you have any questions further, connect with Lizzie or any of other, other participants. 
email me and I'm happy to connect you. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining today. Lizzie, thank you so much for presenting. It was a real thank pleasure. Thank you, it's really fun. Thank you for everybody for listening. Um, and everyone have a lovely day. Um, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.